My name is Bruno Munger. I'm Director of Business Development at Colorfront. Uh, I'm here to introduce Bill. Uh, Colorfront, we do dailies, transcoding. Uh, we started not in the cloud because uh, the event of digital cameras about 2007, 2008 with the RED camera, the Amira camera, uh, the Alexa camera, there needed to be some tools to transcode all these files and people were shooting more and more and then we needed to come up with tools. We came up with onset dailies, express dailies, and now the latest tool called Transcoder. We've been in the cloud for many years, but since we do uh, $100 million movies and episodic televisions, not everyone, not the big studios, were more like, uh, let's not move anything into cloud infrastructure yet. So, but we've been in the cloud, we've had projects like the suitcase and a lot of customers have used our, our tools in the cloud and Bill's gonna talk about it. So with Colorfront, we have a post-production house in Budapest and we have, we're also a vendor and we sell to all the people making movies, probably 90% of all the movies and TV shows that you're watching at home, they use Express Ailey's Colorfront. And we've been doing this for seven years. We're Academy Award winner on our previous technology. We wrote a color grading tools. We now have uh, Daily's tools and Bill's gonna talk about it. Bill Feitner, our CTO. Hi. So I'll try to try to get through this as quickly as possible, and then uh, uh, one of the things that uh, I want to talk about a little bit is uh, uh, some of the special deliveries. So uh, first, uh, let's just go through these slides, okay? So um, you know what are we doing today? Well, the the dilemma is is that we have images coming from a multitude of sources, uh, different cameras, different. Uh, 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 you know, from computers, any way of generating images. Um, and then at some point, uh, we have to do something, work on all these different uh, uh, non-integrated things. They're all different flavors and everything else. And then we have to deliver an ever-increasing uh, to different formats, different color spaces and things. So let's talk a little bit about that. Uh, one of the biggest problems is, is how do we digest everything? If we go back to some of the previous slides that we were showing on uh, the suitcase projects, that uh, all of the images and everything are pointing into our, our software world. Uh, our software bridges uh, pre-production all the way through final delivery. And uh, so that's, uh, that's this is, uh, in going back in the past, this is sort of how traditional production was done. We do pre-production, we do the actual photography production, computer-generated images. We'd come in and then try to sort it all out and redo a lot of things in post-production and then we'd deliver it. Very, a very inefficient workflow and also a workflow that does not work well with today's needs where we have a multitude of different things coming in and we have people all over the globe. Uh, we want to access this stuff in different time zones, whenever, wherever. We, uh, we want to do be doing the cut, the vi visual effects. We want to do the design. We may be in, in different locations. So everything is, uh, you know, seems, seems chaotic, but that's just the way it works. That's, that's how we live our, our personal lives. I mean, we have uh, different, uh, you know, like on our iPhones, we, we can uh, collaborate with our friends all around the world. It's just our industry that uh, is really behind the times on doing that. So uh, these, these are some things we do. And there are some big challenges facing us now. The big, the big word is more. We want more of everything. And, and that gets down to uh, in imaging, well, we try to oversample images. That means larger and larger images. Uh, we started out with uh, film. And then we digitized film. We used to digitize it at 2K. Now we're shooting with uh, uh, digital cameras, films all but uh, uh, absent uh, other than a few, uh, few special uh, films. So everything's being captured digitally. Um, the first digital cameras were HD. That, was, uh, that were really being used for motion picture production and, and for television. And then uh, we've moved on to uh, uh, 3K, 2.5K, 3K, now 4K, and then there's uh, even higher capture rates. Uh, so so in, the, in the source, another thing we're doing is the frame rates when we're capturing things. Uh, that's the reason I f uh, brought up the question, well, what is real time? Well, we don't know what real time is. It's, it's uh, getting as many temporal samples from the real world when we're photographing as possible because we can do something with this later on. Gone are the days, well, it's going out to film. It's going to be 
projected in a motion picture theater at 24 frames per second. So yeah, great, let's set the camera at 24 frames per second. Or it's going out for TV, which is 60 fields per second. Let's uh, have a camera set at that. Well, today is, we don't, we're, we're gonna be doing both. We are, we'll go out to a multitude of different uh, delivery temporal rates and uh, the more captures we can get, the more uh, information we have to work with. So, uh, so these are some of the dilemmas we're facing. So we have the, the temporal side of it. We've got uh, color while well, we're saying, you know, used to be everything was just uh, Rec 709, which is what normal television is. Well, now we're talking about uh, wider color gamuts, wider color spaces, because this all relates to making better pictures, telling the stories with better looking images. And so we've got things coming from various sources. And then we need to deliver to a lot of different sources. One of the newest buzzwords out there, which uh, is HDR. I'll get into that a little bit later. Um, so we're also talking about, and that's this right here, what is the dynamic range? How much do we capture? So we have, well, what is the capture range in the image? Uh, you know, everyone can take their iPhone and take a picture and it has this magic word that says HDR. That means that you can uh, grab more range, but how do we display it? What we're really interested in is on the display side. That's what's really changing in terms of uh, high dynamic range where we can actually have a, a larger range between black and white. And with the new consumer sets just around the corner, Utilizing this uh, high dynamic range allows us to create scenes that have much more vividness. We'll get into a little bit more of that later. So that's one of the other things. Um, we talked about the uh, spatial side and the resolutions. Uh, we talked about, you know, how do we uh, digest all of this and put it into the same thing? And, and that's, that's what we've been addressing. We, it should be just as simple as that. You shouldn't have to give a second thought to that. Your, your thought on the production side should be, Let's create uh, our work of art. Let's tell the story with the best looking pictures and as, as we can. So um, that's been what we've been uh, working with. As Bruno mentioned, this is that our lab is uh, an actual production house uh, in Budapest that uh, uh, develops the software, uh, tests it, and then releases it uh, to the open market. So uh, the other thing is how do we exchange this data? We have uh, a multitude of different file formats from capture to delivery, and each one of them uh, no one's better than another. They serve different purposes. So how do we digest all of that? It, it's a formidable uh, challenge in, in the, the world today. Uh, we have different cameras, each one having their own unique uh, file format. We have different image formats. This is, this is from the source. We have uh, you know, just some examples of some delivery uh, file formats. And this is ever growing. I mean, it just keeps growing and growing because we got to serve a lot of different things. It used to be you shoot a film and you saw it in the cinema. You know, you put it on the film projector in the deal. You took a video camera, you shot something for TV, you put it out for a TV set. Well, those days are gone. I mean, we shoot something, we create content, we create a uh, work, and it's got to serve all these different delivery markets, each one of them uniquely different and, and for reasons. And how do you uh, digest all of that? How do you approach it? So uh, these are... Some of the new, uh, just an example of some of the new delivery formats. IMF is an interesting format. I wish I could spend more time on some of these things, but the concept of this new delivery format in IMF is, is that, well, we're delivering to different markets. We want different versions. Uh, we want uh, different languages, different cuts, different content for different uh, geographic regions because of cultural differences, language differences, and all of this. Uh, when we start coming back, if we made a separate finish for each one of those things, we, it, it would just be an incredible amount. It'd be a room full of uh, a stack of data. So the idea is, is to have uh, this, uh, the IMF format where uh, the image essence is there. In other words, all the different versions are there. Most of it is common to everything, but then the differences. And then we have metadata that goes along with it. This is a simplistic view of it that sorts it out so it's a playlist for all the different regions. And the nice thing about that format is, is that we can update it. So once something's out, we can uh, send out a, a new playlist and uh, patch files. In other words, uh, that can be sent out and uh, supplemental files and uh, with the supplemental playlist and then that can ex uh, change some of the content. So this is just, you know, this adds to the complication of delivering. There's uh, just for the cinema alone, these are just a few examples of uh, different uh, delivery formats just for the movie theaters, the digital formats. So um, MXF formats is another big wrapper. It's a wrapper for, that's used widely across many uh, different pieces of con content. And uh, the other thing is, is uh, 
what comes out of all the different cameras, the color spaces uh, are completely different. How do we digest that? Uh, no two cameras see the world the same way. No two cameras have the same color science. No two cameras, and people say, well, why don't they? And there's reasons for not. There's also, it's a free market, and it's the same reason we all speak different languages around the world, and, and I don't think that's going to change. I mean, but how do we digest all that? So that's some of the things we do. Um, these are just some of the, just a list of some of the many, many color formats that are out there coming out of, just from the source, from the capture side that are used. And there, these are a lot of the different color working spaces that people work in. So one effects house may work in this color space, another effects house works in another color space. Luckily, um, the industry is trying to standardize uh, on a common color space in exchange, and that's uh, called ACES, that's being promoted by the Academy. And at least it's a, param uh, a set of parameters that you uh, store things, put things into this color space, and uh, then we have a common working place, and that's gaining some traction. We've been uh, one of the uh, leaders in, uh, in moving that effort forward. I've, I've been part of the committee since it started in 2004 or 5, I guess it was. So, uh, so there's some hope there, but uh, even so, you still have to do a lot of uh, transcoding and sorting things out. Uh, this is just some examples of some of the new uh, delivery spaces that are out there, and it's just a formidable list. So. Um, Luckily for the suitcase project, uh, the delivery part has is, is been, it's, it's based on an ACES workflow, so uh, that will simplify it. That's, that's a more modern uh, workflow that we have at least a, a, an agreed upon color space and uh, that we all can uh, work with. Um, so here's this, this uh, quick graph showing, here are some of the things that push us to better and better pictures. You know, we, we have extended dynamic range, we have more pixels, we have the frame rate. Uh, extended color palettes and uh, compression. These are all things that have to work together uh, and uh, no one set combination gives you the best picture. It's sort of tuned, fine-tuned, dependent upon content and the delivery goals. But uh, as we move forward to increasing the picture quality, we can see that uh, storage bandwidth, interactivity, and processing are things that we have to contend with. In other words, as the pictures get bigger and uh, the color spaces get larger, uh, it requires more horsepower on the processing side. So, uh, so it's just uh, maintaining all these delivery sources, having enough processing power and bandwidth to have real-time interactivity, and then add that to the fact that people are geographically dispersed and people want to have that interactivity where, wherever they are. Um, that these are some of the problems we, we are trying to solve so that uh, you can be wherever you are and still have an interactive uh, session working with your data and see, uh, you know, real-time updates on it. And, uh, and you don't always have optimal connection speeds. So it's a, it's a combination of uh, local processing and then cloud-based processing. Local processing for uh, user uh, uh, interaction. So you, you get, a, get a, a great experience there, and then the heavy lifting at the full resolution can happen up in the cloud, uh, in the cloud processing. So these, these are some of the things that we're working on on our software to move into the virtual world and into the uh, uh, cloud processing world. Um, so we, we have a number of components. Just, I'll just go through these really quickly. We, we touch everything probably from uh, the very first, this is sort of a little bit out of order, the third item down, onset uh, look design tool, is probably something that the cinematographer uses at the time he's out scouting shots and can sort of set and design a look. Uh, that look becomes nothing more than metadata. That, uh, that uh, look can be set with the still camera, and that's one of the advantages, and then when it's replaced with a whatever camera the production decides to shoot with, then uh, though that metadata look can be applied to that because all the cameras are going through and being digested uh, into this common color working space. So whatever looks we set on one camera, um, if the other camera was shot in the same, with the same settings in the same uh, environment, you'd get the same result. So that's, that's a very popular thing to try to set the, start designing a look. And then uh, the next thing that uh, we're involved with is uh, the uh, uh, on-set dailies, express dailies, which is either on-set or near-set. And this is what's happening iteratively as we're doing the production. Uh, uh, frames will be shot, there'll be people, the, 
content, we'll come in, we'll parse through the content, we'll start applying looks, we'll check the content, we'll do some uh, editorial, we'll probably be part of that process, editorial, we'll start doing some selects and some picks. Some of those frames then will de be delivered out to the uh, effects houses. The effects will start working, doing some initial work with frames, maybe even proxy resolution, but at least the, but they're spatially correct in terms of position, so they can do positional tracking and things. And, uh, and, um, and then uh, we keep uh, iterating as we go. We may replace the frames with some new capture frames. We may not be happy with them. So that's today's world is this continual interactive, iterative process uh, working with the data as opposed to, well, we'll figure out what we're going to do later on in post and this to start sh uh, shooting things. I mean, that just doesn't work today to meet all the different uh, delivery formats. So, uh, so we have another tool that's called Onset Live. This gives you uh, uh, a live preview right out of the camera that shows you accurate color to what you were, uh, um, uh, you know, depending on the look, you can modify the look that goes into the metadata, goes into the look files, and then that uh, is populated across the whole workflow so everybody uh, uh, can see the same thing as we keep iterating and updating it. Uh, we have a piece of software called Copy Central. This is a handshake uh, with uh, for getting images up to and from the cloud. In fact, we were demonstrating that a couple years ago where we were playing back using this software um, uh, live uh, 4K that was being rendered to uh, JPEG 2000, played back uh, over a, a link from the cloud, from our cloud site, uh, to a, a live uh, 4K projector. I think Eric was there when we did that a couple of years couple years ago in uh, San Diego, yeah. So, I mean, that's, that's just the power of uh, processing in the cloud, and that was u utilizing uh, uh, GPU. All, most of our software is based on GPU for the image handling, and we rely on CPU for a lot of uh, codecs that uh, are only written in CPU, like uh, ProRes and things like this. It's only available uh, currently uh, on uh, CPU, so our, our software uh, comprises both. So uh, the other thing we have at this listed very bottom is called a color front engine, and this is our uh, sort of uh, the our main image processing engine. In other words, when frames come in and they go out, and all the different co uh, file transforms, color space uh, uh, transcodes, uh, and then adding the creative look and managing that across different things. That's what that's part of. Um, you know, just quickly going through these because I want to spend a little more time. How much time do I have, Eric? Uh, I wouldn't. Oh, okay, good. Well, we'll keep going then. All right, so we have, um, you know, this is just showing some of the things that we have for Onset Dailies. Uh, Onset Dailies has two different uh, 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 versions, a uh, uh, very heavy lifting. Uh, it's called o o Onset Dailies OSD and then EXD Extended Dailies, which is a lighter version, a simplified version for uh, doing your dailies. And that's where you basically start with uh, setting the look on your file. That's where the color set and everything else. That can be done collaboratively over the, through the cloud where people can be, different work groups can be associated with it and be part of that process where say the final colorist is uh, somewhere else in uh, some other part of the world and he can also, you know, put his uh, stamp on, uh, his look stamp on what you're doing. Um, the onset color uh, can work, uh, with uh, any uh, images from virtually any of the modern cameras, each one has its own input profile so that uh, uh, when we're doing the color work, we're working in a common color workspace. It's an AC space that's, again, based on AC so that, uh, for example, any of those cameras there, including, and then any of the modern capture cameras from RED, ARRI, which is most, you know, a very dominant camera, um, Panasonic, Canon has uh, live motion picture cameras. They could, all, if they all pointed at the scene, the code values in the color working space would uh, that represent the capture range of the camera would be the same until one camera runs out of steam. You know, some of them can't capture as much range as the other, but within the common area, uh, and that allows you to do great things. And that that means that you add a color to one camera, you can import it. Uh, the look metadata is then portable between cameras. That's why people can go out and scout with one of the still cameras uh, and then uh, design their look and then uh, faithfully apply that look to the final uh, capture plan camera, provided it's shooting the same thing. If it's shooting co something completely different, well, you're going to have to alter the look uh, for the content. So um, just a quick thing uh, with our Copy Central software for getting things efficiently, getting things up and down. People, uh, you know, have had good success with that. Uh, uh, our interactive platforms, uh, you know, we, we run um, 
on anything that has powerful GPUs. So this is the, the, the smallest platform, so a Mac Pro with its uh, dual GPU cards. And it's, uh, it's, it's pretty. We, were, we did a demo at uh, Camera Image a year ago where uh, uh, some content was shot with the uh, Airy 65 millimeter uh, digital camera. And we just took those f uh, files off. They were recorded and then loaded onto our system. And uh, we were laying off real time with this little computer that fit in a, in a suitcase, making a DCP, and which we, then we showed. That was a great, great thing for an audience to see. Here is the top digital camera. You know, it's uh, you know, high resolution, 6.5K, and uh, we're processing the raw files from it real time and making the DCP package to show to the audience. So that's pretty impressive when you think about it, you know, that, that you can do that. And that's what's available today with, you know, something that small. And then, of course, uh, uh, we have interactive platforms. We support the new uh, iMac or Retina 5K because it has a decent display on it and can show fairly high resolution images. So we can do the interactive stuff on there if we want. If uh, DP is sitting in his uh, uh, hotel room, well, then he can be designing looks or reviewing the uh, the, the shoot uh, dailies or whatever on that and then put his input in there. Um, uh, the real centralized uh, heavy lifting is uh, the OSD transcoder and that's what's being used on the suitcase project and everything can point to this. This is sort of like the center hub and this can be either hardware sitting in, uh, in a rack the hardware itself is a box, it's a super microcomputer on the, the highest, uh, I'll show you a slide of that. It can uh, crunch real time. It, uh, we were showing that two years ago with this uh, computer with four graphics cards in it, uh, running uh, real time 60, well, whatever real time is, running 60 frames per second uh, at 8K in processing images. So, and this was for NHK because, uh, you know, though we don't have 8K here, it's, it's alive and well and growing in uh, Japan. So. We'll see. You know, it's just the uh, more is better. So, uh, and then also this software then runs uh, virtually in the cloud, and we're on the Amazon uh, uh, G2 nodes, and uh, we're uh, in talks with uh, Google to support, uh, and we're testing on their uh, 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 GPU nodes also. So, uh, and this is just a growing thing. There'll be companies like this. There are private companies. There are uh, private clouds. Uh, you know, this is just this is the way it's going to be. I mean, people will uh, post-production or a production will not have hardware sitting in there other than terminal gear to allow them to interact with stuff. It's going to someone else is going to do that. Uh, either public cloud companies or uh, private uh, companies, uh, and that's just the way because it's it's too expensive. It's too hard to do it yourself. So basically, you know, you get a hose brought in and uh, all the crunching is somewhere else, and you do what you do best. That's the creative side. And uh, so we're very much part of that. Uh, so we support uh, full 8K. This is the ultimate computer as it is right there. Is this because this particular box allows us to stuff four uh, GPU cards in there? And uh, that's where we get the real-time 8K. Or what we were showing uh, here, also we can play out two real-time uh, 4K pictures on two monitors in different color spaces for interactivity. So it just, you know, just the sheer power. Or we can be making digital cinema packages that close to 500 frames per second. So instead of waiting a couple of days to crunch out uh, your DCP package uh, for the cinema on a hardware-based uh, system, the software-based system can be doing it at 500 frames a second. So, uh, you know, that doesn't take very long to run through a, a, a movie. Um, uh, the other platforms we have is like on a HPZ840 workstation and uh, things like this, transcoder in the cloud, uh, remote grading. The, the nice thing about the cloud, I think the driving force behind it right now, people are arguing, well, is it cheaper to have stuff in my machine room or is it uh, uh, cheaper just to outsource it to the cloud? And uh, it's a question. What we're seeing right now is that it's probably it's not cheaper in the cloud, but it allows you to do things that you couldn't do, and that's the collaboration. And, uh, and I think eventually that will be cheaper. I think uh, prices are going down and we're going to find that. But I think the main thing is that it's empowering us to do things in production that lower the overall cost because we can collaborate no matter where we are at any time. And, and uh, that's, that's the way we're heading. So it's just, uh, it's just going to go that way. And it's going really, I think, quite quickly. Um, so that just sort of shows us that, yeah, we're, we've been up with this for... Uh, several years testing it because they were the first ones to offer GPU processing and we really rely on that because of the speed that we can do with it. Um, the uh, thing we were talking about is our whole image processing pipeline uh, with all these needs of these 
larger and larger color spaces, frame rates, uh, resolutions. We need an engine to process things that doesn't step on any of that. So uh, we utilize the full bandwidth that's available in the GPUs, 32-bit floating point uh, processing, and at uh, you know lightning speeds. And that's basically the heart of our whole thing. And it's a ACES compliant workflow. And it basically, in the background, sorts out all of these various things. We have. Different, we handle different files because of our software, so that really doesn't matter with the user. You can take a, a whole range of different cameras, plug it into the product, and as long as the cameras have the proper metadata in their uh, header, which most cameras do, we automatically detect that, and you don't, as a user, you don't have to worry about it. You just wake up with an automatic default beautiful picture. You know, I take my iPhone out of the pocket, I take a picture, I'm usually happy with it. Yeah, I might wish I'd done this or that, but it's a pretty good base picture. Take any, I challenge anyone, take a, uh, any of the modern uh, cameras that we use for the cinema and try to do that and put it up somewhere. And people are going to be hemming and hawing, going around in circles, twiddling knobs just to try to get a baseline picture. And it's, it's ridiculous. So anyway, uh, with the proper science behind it, you should be able to plug in any of the good cameras, as long as it's properly exposed, uh, and come up with a good baseline picture. In fact, most of our demos we've done uh, for all our different shows have been completely ungraded, un unedited, you know, just properly shot pictures. And then, of course, the work of the colorist is to go through and impart a look, you know, a feel on it, you know, change the color temperature, change the exposure, not to try to just get a base image. So that's what uh, part of what this system does. And then it can serve all the different output requirements. And uh, um, that's uh, been really, really helpful. I mean, we, that's why people have been utilizing the software, sort of, uh, runs through that. People can, as well as uh, handshake with their favorite, if they have a favorite color correction platform that's integral with our system, that we can handshake with those images. We publish images, they go out to the color correction platform, whatever one the colorist is uh, you know, most comfortable with and likes to use. He can do his work and then it comes back into the uh, Colorfront product and then we can do all the different versioning, uh, all the different deliveries. So that's one of the big things uh, that just sort of shows some of the uh, you know, a use case here where you have all the different camera formats coming in, automatic uh, input transforms based on the metadata, and then uh, we have a whole set of uh, color correction adjustments that are what is called scene referred, and that's a real important concept to get. Scene referred means that we're dealing with the, with the light, altering the light as it, uh, as it falls on the sensor or the equivalent, because we figure the sensor is seeing the real world. It hasn't, uh, each, if we negate the camera, we're back to the actual photons that were falling on the sensor. So that's, that's what we can do. So we can alter camera exposure, we can alter uh, scene color temperature, and this is really a useful thing that's normally not available in uh, color correction. And then we have the creative uh, color correction where it's a combination of uh, a look library, we have a default look that just wakes up and looks really good on just about every camera. Uh, and then there's a whole uh, library of different looks where you can mix and match them. And, uh, and this is often done uh, up front with this, at the scouting phase where, uh, from the stills where we start setting some basic looks. And that metadata just goes into this engine and puts it in there. And then, then there's the output transform um, where um, the, uh, we go out to all the different uh, delivery things. So uh, I want to spend a little time talking about something that's really Dear, I think that this project, something Aaron and I talked about, and that was, uh, well, let's capture and let's, let's do this project in HDR. Does, how many people here know what HDR is? Uh, great. Um, do you like it? Yes. It's an interesting thing. So just to give a little talk on that, okay. I, I've done this talk a lot of times. It, it becomes a very political subject. There's people who say, oh, I hate it, I like it, I hate it. I mean, I, I think people hated the telephone when it first was invented, too, you know, but it's, it's really nothing new. In fact, if we go back in history, when we take people who were sitting, you know, in the 16th century, 17th century, and we're going to theater and watching a stage play, they were seeing HDR. It's whatever level of lighting they wanted to impart on the stage. It's only more recently when we started trying to capture images with film and, with, uh, and then later with uh, uh, television cameras that we had to have standard dynamic, what we call quote unquote standard dynamic range images. In other words, we couldn't capture that much range and we certainly couldn't uh, display that much range. So, um, so really if we think of it, SDR is really the newcomer in there and now we're getting to the point where the technology on the display side 
is uh, allowing us to display a much larger range. And it can be, when properly used, it can be very dramatic. And that's, uh, so that's, what S that's my take on the SDR and HDR. And I can guarantee within a year, we won't even be talking about it. It's just, that's just the way we're going to watch pictures. And uh, uh, we've been capturing wide dynamic range pictures for quite some time with, uh, with the uh, latest uh, digital cameras. And, uh, and we've just been compressing or trying to squeeze it into something. I, I don't have equipment to show you the difference. I would uh, invite anyone who's really interested in the subject. We can do some great demos on this. Um, but because the only way you can show HDR is you have to have the display device. This and this will not do it. They, they, uh, they don't have enough contrast range. So that's the difference. And that's what we're seeing with HDR. Where are people going to see HDR first? They're going to see it at home. Um, uh, it's just that there are technological limitations as to what we can show in the cinema. Uh, Dolby has uh, uh, come up with a system, though it's not bright, it's very, very dark, which means you have to make the whole environment extremely dark. Your eyes adapt to the darkness. So with a roughly about double, a little more than double the light output of a typical cinema, it, it can make some pretty dramatic pictures. But when we're talking about HDR uh, in the home, we're talking about something that's many, many times brighter because we're overcoming a dim surround environment. And uh, so right now, if we think about Dolby Cinema, which is around 108 nits or so, we talk about a typical cinema when we go into digital cinema the cinema should be at 48 nits. Nits is candela per meter squared. It's, it's, a, measure, it's a linear measurement of, of brightness. So twice the nits means there's twice the light output. But an important point to remember, our eyes don't see it that way. The brighter it gets, the less difference it makes. At the very dark level, it's a lot. As we get brighter and brighter and brighter, we don't see much of a difference. So, uh, so if we have, for example, the mastering standard for television, uh, currently, it's been uh, 100 nits, okay? And uh, if we go to uh, uh, 1,000 nits, um, which is sort of the level of the consumer, sort of ballpark level of what the newest uh, consumer displays can offer, that's, you say, ah, that's uh, 1,000 to 100? Wow, that's a lot of increase. Well, it's really only, in terms of perceptual side, a little over twice the magnitude and brightness, which is still a lot. I mean, something twice as bright is quite a bit, but it takes that much more light to get it to that brightness. To go up an equal amount from 1,000 to see the same effect from going from 100 to 1,000, you have to go up, and this is really in rough terms, you have to go up to about 10,000 nits. So, so, you know, it's, it's just like sound. You know, sound is a, sort of a logarithmic function where you, you get a lot of effect at the bottom and then it just tapers off where it's less and less. And the same thing with HDR. But I can tell you, if you properly do HDR, and this is some of the research we've been working on, is how do we map things in this new things? Well, so content that's mastered, commonly mastered, will look good in both. And we've been working, doing a lot of work on perceptual algorithms and things, or how our eyes see colors, and that's the basic thing, how we respond to brightness, and we automatically map between the two, which gets you really close, so that you're not just having to make two separate productions going from you know, one for SDR and then one for HDR. And wherever that dividing line is, I'll let someone else, the politician, someone decide whether it's SDR or HDR because it's really a gradual scale. And like I said, in a year or so from now, we're not going to have that discussion. It's just, it's just we're just going to have this extra dynamic range. And then somewhere in the future, I keep my fingers crossed, that we'll have uh, affordable technology that allows us to see that in the cinema so we can see it across the board. We're not going to see it on the little tablets and things right away. The other thing about HDR is, is that uh, if you're in a very, very bright room, for example, with 1,000 nits, most consumer sets already are running 200 to 300 nits. In other words, they're already pretty bright. People are just scaled up and they're watching it in a very bright room. So the difference between 300 and 1,000 isn't as much as you think. So to see really good HDR, even in the home, you do have to have a more controlled lighting environment to really take advantage of it. So, Okay, good.